All right, look, thanks everyone for coming. It's great to see you all. Thanks, uh, Martha, Tim, uh, and the whole team here. It's great to see you all. So my talk today is entitled Against Determinism. Um, I particularly want to give a shout out to Julio Prisco because I'm, I'm sorry the time zones aren't working um, because um, you've helped me with some of this thinking um, and I'd, I'd really um, covet your feedback on, on this talk. I'm trying to cover an enormous amount of ground on the thought of determinism. So um, please be please accept that some of it's very high level and needs uh, a lot more thought. Um, and so particularly um, Calvin versus Arminius, I know that um, that'll be an interesting one. Um, and that fundamentally why deterministic thinking is unhelpful and how to, to combat it. So we're in a Christian group here, so I want to start with a verse of scripture. Um, faith is a confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And I've underlined there what we do not see. Um, full disclosure, so I'm speaking from a mix of uh, Anglican charismatic traditions. I regard scripture as a mix of direct revelation, allegory, history, human thoughts and inspired insights. Um, and as I said in my talk to the 2019 conference, uh, my tradition and Omar's tradition, um, which is the same tradition, um, finds truth in scripture, tradition, reason and experience and seeks to understand the world and solve problems in, in accordance with those four things, scripture, tradition, reason and experience. Uh, in my day job, I'm a principal in an engineering consultancy and I personally put a lot of professional effort into uh, defining the boundary be between what we do know and what we don't know and sorting through conflicting advice from different disciplines. So I want to emphasize this, it's assurance about what we do not see and for example, I'd, I'd describe the age of the earth as seen, that is evident beyond reasonable doubt. Now, I'm hearing, that's scripture's definition of faith. I'm hearing in, out there in the, in the world an atheistic definition of faith, which I'm going to try and steal man um, for this purpose. I've heard this from Sam Harris. I've heard it from lots of people. Um, faith is believing something contrary to evidence. Faith is believing something based on cherry-picked evidence and tenuous implausible reasoning. Um, that to me is not scripture's definition of faith. Um, faith is consistent with reason in James 3.17 and a lot of places Jesus is talking to the disciples, he's encouraging them to reason. He's not encouraging them to, to take things dogmatically. He's saying, you know, think about what this parable means. Um, so I, I don't disagree with Sam Harris and others that um, what I'm calling here denialist pseudo faith. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing that it exists uh, in the in the church even, and I'm not not um, disagreeing that it's a real thing also in the wider world. Okay, um, so what am I against? So there's a, a bit of a memeplex out there: uh, fundamentalist determinism and atheism. Uh, firstly, that God doesn't exist; that the universe requires no explanation. There's no intelligence external to the universe. The laws of physics just kind of wrote themselves. Um, the universe or the multiverse is infinite in past and future time. Um, the turtles all the way down is a, is a real thing. Uh, or, and and I've, I've talked at, at length in, in this forum and others about the, the concept of, of the simulation. And that, um, does everyone remember the story of turtles all the way down? Uh, okay. I love to hear it every time, so. <laughs> Mark's um, Mark's shaking his head. Uh, you know, it's the old story. There's there's a, a young lecturer and she's giving a lecture on, uh, in in first year uni, and she holds up a big globe and says, "Look, you know, here's the round Earth. This is geology 101." And um, one of the traditional parents, who's a bit older, is snuck in the back and says, "Ah, oh, professor, you're very clever. You're a very clever young lady, but um, the world's obviously flat." You know, you can look around and, and see that it's flat. And so she says, well, you know, why doesn't the world fall? And he says, well, he says, that's because it's landing on, the, it's resting on the back of this giant turtle. And she says, okay. So, and the guy says, stops her and says, look, um, I know what you're about to ask. You're about to ask, what's a turtle resting on top of? Let me tell you, it's turtles all the way down. Uh, so that's that's a, a cute little parable. Uh, I've heard it from, um, I think it was Dawkins put it in one of his books. Um, 
and I've, I've heard it from other places as well. But the, um, the, the concept there, it's an attempt that in my view fails, but it's an attempt to mock the first cause argument for the existence of God. So when we say that we posit something that is uncaused, you can't turn around and say, well, what caused that? What, what we're positing is that um, from a, a purely logical sense, uh, something external to the creation um, simulation that we're existing in, uh, that causation, and, and maybe there's like, uh, I'm going to come up with um, a, a physicist theory that we're actually living in 11 dimensions, not four. But you know, if there's three dimensions of time, what does that mean for the concept of causation? So um, because turtles all the way down, you've either got to choose between infinite regression and brute fact. Um, I regard both of those as um, deeply unrewarding at best. Uh, but if you then say, well, look, something's wrong with the concept of causation. So then causation as we know it is a feature of the simulation. That's why it makes sense to have a, a first cause that's external to the simulation. Um, anyway, it's a short digression. Uh, the other one is um, another one in this uh, fundamentalist um, determinist atheist uh, memeplex is that consciousness does not exist. It's an illusion. So there's a funny story on that one as well. Um, a young chap listens to a Daniel Dennett lecture, uh, hearing that consciousness is illusion. He's listened, listened to it on YouTube. So he, he turns up to his philosophy class the next day and he says, oh, professor, he says, um, well, listen to this lecture. I'm, I'm really concerned that I don't really exist. You know, how do I, how do I find out if I, if I actually exist or not? I'm really worried. You know, I've got to know. I've got to know. Um, and the professor says, oh, yeah, exactly. Who wants to know? So, so there's another complete uh, non sequitur here that if something is an illusion, then there's something suffering that illusion. Uh, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of a, a denialist. Um, anyway, so our behavior is deterministic, that free will doesn't exist or is an illusion. And that the universe itself is fundamentally deterministic. And there's the concept of the Laplace demon. So does anyone know what the Laplace demon idea is? Okay, uh, seeing so the, the concept is that the Laplace demon is this incredibly intelligent um, being that is able to track, understand exactly where every molecule is and where it's going. And because of that, it's able to predict the future and precisely, and that nothing can go wrong with, at the moment, I know every single molecule in the universe and I, can, I know its position and trajectory. And so from that, I can then predict absolutely everything in the future of the universe, what Lincoln's going to have for breakfast tomorrow, for instance. And that's a part of this um, memeplex. And to me, the, the fundamentalist label seems appropriate and I'll, I'll, I'll come to why. Okay, I'm referencing four books today. They're very different books. And um, hey, so Jonathan, Einstein's... can I comment quick? On yeah, your last sure. Slide yeah. Yep. Before you go on, yeah. Um, I I wanted to point out that there are quite a few theisms that yep. are compatible with bullet points number one and number two. Those are those yeah. bullet points do not entail atheism. For example, with with the first one, um, there are theisms such as um, Mormonism yep. that they don't try to explain the origin of the universe. Maybe yep. it, maybe, um, maybe it did exist forever. Um, maybe it didn't. Hmm. It's it's an open question in Mormonism, and Mormonism is not alone. There are other theisms as well that that do that. Um, and on the second one. Uh, appealing to God actually doesn't solve any of those problems because if we say, well, I'm not happy with the brute fact e explanation yep. that the universe just exists. And I'm not happy with the idea of an infinite regression of universes. So I'm going to say God did it. Well, is God just a brute, brute fact or is God an infinite regression? So yeah. appealing to God doesn't actually solve anything for these problems, um, except it might, it might aesthetically, it might emotionally. And that's worth something. Yeah, but... absolutely. absolutely. Um, I hear what you're saying, Lincoln. On the second dot point, um, it's not so much that 
I'm appealing to God as such. I mean, I am. But what I'm what I'm appealing to is that there's something um, incomplete about our perception of causation, and that causation external to this simulation must mean something different. And when suppose there's three dimensions of time, I don't know what causation means, and I haven't thought about how to how to conceive that. So it's not necessarily appealing to God, but what it's appealing to is that our perception of causation is incomplete. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And there's theisms that embrace this idea that creation is neither infinite nor finite, but something indefinite that yep. the further you look back at it, the more complex it becomes something along those yeah. lines. Yeah. Um, and then my last comment was, is kind of just tongue in cheek on your last bullet point. I actually don't eat anything for breakfast. So you couldn't predict what I'm going to eat for breakfast. Okay. That's great. <laughs> All righty. Uh, thanks. No, that, that that was really good. And I'm really pleased that you, you probed those points. And I'm, I want people to probe what I'm saying and, and do feel free to interrupt. Otherwise, I'm, I'm prone to rabbiting on. So there's, there's four books that I'm referencing here. Um, Einstein's Intuition is written by a guy called Thad Roberts. So I went looking for determinist alternatives to um, the Copenhagen interpretation um, of quantum mechanics. And I ran into this guy who's an absolute character. Um, he's a genius. This book is 600 pages of some very difficult physics that I couldn't follow um, and and some that I could, and it's full of anecdotes and stuff. So it's it's a great read, but it's not an easy read, and it took me ages to get through. And after the, after the 600 pages, there's like 100 pages of um, bibliography and, and definitions and stuff. So it's it's a remarkable achievement. And he puts forward a mathematically... I presume complete, although I'm not in a position to judge that, a, a, a defensible mathematical position that the universe actually has 11 dimensions and we're only living in four of those 11 and the other 11, um, when you when you run all your calculations in that other 11 dimensions, it's um, everything is deterministic. Now, the second one, Free Will by Sam Harris. Um, I don't recommend you read this. It's poorly written um, diatribe, basically. Burn, um, sick burn. <laughs> sorry, I'm probably not. Sam's probably not going to have me on his podcast now. Um, so, and I'll, and, and he, he semi sort of debunks him, himself, but I'll just for the moment draw attention to the the puppet strings that he he calls us he calls us biochemical puff, puppets. Uh, the next one, um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, is a classic book, and it was influential in my life when it came out in the I can't remember what year, early '90s somewhere, I think. Uh, I haven't reread really that lately, but I, I am referencing a couple of key quotes from it. And the other one is Willpower um, and I'd, by, by these guys, and that's um, rediscovering our, our greatest human strength that we can make decisions, that we can drive change ourselves. Uh, and I'd also recommend um, Kelly McGonigal's book on that also, G-O-N-I-G-A-L. You can, you can look her up. Um, all right. So I went looking for what's determinism about in physics and in culture. So I mentioned Laplace's demon. Now, a lot of it started with Newton calculating regularity in orbits. So before that, we had this conception that the world just, just was what it was, and we uh, were living in this creation. Um, Newton introduced the idea of laws and rules. Uh, well, other people did as well, but he, he, he calculated and did some remarkable stuff up front. Uh, but determinism is now contrary to the majority understanding in, in contemporary physics. Einstein wanted determination to be true. It was his intuition that God does not play dice. But what we've learned since then, um, the preponderance of evidence, um, Einstein and Spinoza's God, they, they have a view of God that's a mechanist. And, and Lincoln's going to tell me that this is potentially um, compatible with various theisms as well, and it is. It, I guess it's a deist view. Um, of a, a mechanistic view of the self-existent universe and God is the sum of, of all natural laws. So that was there, that was Einstein's intuition. Um, we, and it's, it's in a lot of our culture. So in the early 80s, a guy called Benjamin Libet um, did some experiments. So th these experiments purported to show that we decide to move our wrist before we're aware of the side. So you had people do this little experiment where they were flicking their wrist at random times, random in their own head. 
and looking at a clock and reporting where the clock was when they decided and then and then he videotaped when they actually moved and he had a whole bunch of wires on their head and purported to show that we decided to do it um, before we were aware that we decided. Now that was my first year at university and I remember it uh, I remember it uh, vividly and it made a huge impact um, because it wasn't just extrapolated from a, a, a dumb little game about flicking your wrist it, it people extrapolated into marriage and career and all sorts of things. And this kind of determinism um, uh, entered uh, our culture. Um, and Libet's experiments have been debunked, some people think conclusively, some not this decade, um, just after Sam published Free Will, where he, he relies on Libet's experiments and two other similar ones. Um, so, so what happened after that? Uh, that left a, a, an unfortunate cultural legacy. Um, and Sam Harris says, I have always regretted mentioning the Libet work in my book, Free Will. Well, now he hasn't always regretted it. Um, what, what do you mean, since one plank second after it was published? Uh, no, he didn't always regret it. And in fact, he actually believed in it for decades. So uh, he's kind of climbing down out of this somehow. And it's interesting, he's, he's conflicting with Daniel Dennett here. And Dennett is a compatibilist when it comes to free will. So Sam's a determinist, then it's a compatibilist. Um, now, I, I, when I was at uni, I was skeptical about the, this whole Libet experiment. I, I pointed out that it, it was just a, a really dodgy little trick um, that people were suggestible, um, that what they were measuring, the so-called readiness potential was, was highly debatable, but it didn't really get debunked for a long time. And that left a long um, legacy. And look, I don't want to pay tribute to Sam. He's a great guy and he says some useful things, but uh, he is prone to not even acknowledging that other viewpoints exist at times, and he's got a very his own very narrow little Overton window. Um, for example, if you read his Atheist Manifesto, he goes on this long rant about the problem of evil and gets to the end of it and says, evil exists, therefore God doesn't, full stop. Um, he doesn't mention anything about the whole Christian, and, and, and it's almost like, oh, these dumb Christians, they didn't even think of that. Uh, yeah, we did. The Bible starts with the fall and says the world is not the way it should be. And uh, and the, the question of evil and theodicy is being dealt with. The three people I will meet is by, by thousands of great thinkers, but in particular, Augustine. Um, our favourite is Iranius. I think uh, several people in this group have time for Iranius's theodicy. And, and even you could pick up on C.S. Lewis's The Problem of Pain. Uh, but to just ignore all that stuff and say, uh, evil exists, therefore God doesn't, is totally just disingenuous. Uh, and that's that's the kind of behaviour that's that Sam's unfortunately um, prone to. Evil exists, therefore good people don't exist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, the reasoning is just as bad or good. Yeah. So, so look, uh, but, but like I say, Sam, he, he gets... He gets in these mindsets and he just goes with them and he doesn't listen to anybody else. And this is unfortunately the story of, um, of, of life. So what, what is determinism in popular culture? Well, even in Sam's book, he says it's not supposed to be fatalism, but in practice, and I, I have a, a quiet little theory in the back of my mind that um, my cohort in Australia is, is more prone to suicide than any other. Uh, there's the people born in this in this generation um, in the 60s for some reason are, are more prone and I wonder if it's part of this uh, determinism and, and we grew up in the shadow of expecting the world to end in nuclear war. Um, other aspects, uh, humans are moist robots. So this is bizarre because Scott Adams, who, who writes the Dilbert cartoon, not only believes that humans are moist robots, but he, he believes in affirmations. So he, he credits his ability, his cartooning success to the fact that he woke up every morning and said, well, I'm going to be the world's greatest cartoonist. Uh, so how he believes in moist robots and affirmations, I don't know. And as I said, Sam calls us uh, biological puppets. There's also this meme out there that says ideas have people rather than people having ideas. That uh, If you're pro or anti-vax or you're pro or anti-climate change or whatever it is that you're in, that, that's, that's an idea that's collecting people. Um, I suggest even within that, people are, are making a decision about which of those ideas to go with. Um, but there's, there's, there's a little bit of, it leads to this idea that we, the mercy of events, um, 
we're watching this movie, we can't do much about it. It leads to psychological dependency, despondency and a sense of limitation. So I wanted to, to, to really understand this. So I found Thad, who I describe as a determined determinist, and incredibly, he responded to me on, on Twitter. So I'm just going to go through this very carefully. So I said I was looking for something that Thad might agree with me is not deterministic. So I thought about how is radioactivity not stochastic? Okay, the word stochastic do, um, means random but predictable when you've got a lot of things together. And so what I'm saying is, do isotopes have this some kind of deterministic rundown method that, that suggests as soon as that's created? Now, for example, carbon-14. Carbon-14 is radioactive, and it's created continuously in the upper atmosphere as, as um, cosmic rays strike a, a um, atom or the, the nucleus of a nitrogen atom, and it knocks out a proton, and it creates carbon-14. Um, it's a very well understood process. So my question is saying, um, at what point is the life of that carbon atom determined? We know on average it's 5,740 years. We know that the standard deviation on that is about 40 years either side, which suggests that within that 240 year period, um, you've got like nearly all that. But, but even so, there'll be some carbon atoms that last five minutes and some that last 100,000 years as carbon-14 before decaying to carbon-13. And so my question was, is that rundown mechanism? How is that rundown mechanism deterministic? Is it when the, the the cosmic ray strikes it? Is there something that is deterministic at that point? What's not random about it? Um, so I'm asking a very specific mechanistic um, question. Does your theory account for this? And this is what what astonishes me is he's come back and he said, since stochastic means occurred without cause, it tautologically defines the indefensible position. So. I asked a very specific um, mechanistic question and I got a philosophical response. Uh, boy, oh boy. And so I, I read this and I, I found it tough and I, I read further on this Bohmian mechanics um, when I didn't find an answer. And, and then I asked him, you know, if base reality at, at the Planck length is deterministic, does that necessitate determinism all the way up or is randomness built in or does strong emergence exist? Uh, and I, I didn't get a, a response, unfortunately. But look, frankly, I'd, I'd rather have questions that can't be answered rather than answers that can't be questioned, which is what you get out of these, these fundamentalists. Um, you know, he, he's, he, he's pushing Bohmian mechanics, which, which has been around, he says, since 1952. Actually, its, it's predecessor, De Broglie, was um, been around since, I think, 1928. I'd have to check that. But... Uh, it's, it's never really got traction. It's had a long time and a lot of physicists look at it. Uh, and look, if, if Thad could reconcile um, Bohmian mechanics with quantum relativity, for instance, he'd, he'd get a Nobel Prize and be more famous than Einstein. Uh, so look, I, he's a great guy and I, I hope he does do some good. But uh, honestly, this next slide is the story of my professional life. I've got to tell you, uh, what I do for a living as a, a, a principal engineer and developing um, at the moment, innovations in a number of different fields is you get so much different advice so the six blind men and the elephant um to me that's that's that up the ladder there he's doing a great job he's described the wall precisely right climb down the ladder and take your blindfold off that you're partly right but there's a bigger picture uh, and the, the other thing I, I have to say to engineers from time to time, especially when they're sort of in their early 30s and sure of themselves is, you know, don't let your expertise narrow your perspective. We always want our engineers to be T-shaped, know a lot about what's going on around you and your own stuff really deeply, but don't be blind to, and a lot of people are. Uh, anyway. All right, evidence against determinism from physics. Firstly, stochastic processes. Uh, so there's quantum mechanics. There's some dissent from the Copenhagen interpretation. Uh, Radioactive half-life I mentioned, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which is related to the others. Um, the good old nice hot cup of tea from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, if anyone remembers that. Uh, it was driving the infinite improbability drive. In, in that case, if you've got a nice hot cup of tea, the uh, motion in that is described as random. The way the heat dissipates out of that is it, it could, on a rare occasion, like dissipate all to one side. Uh, that's extremely rare. But um, but it's it's kind of it's a stochastic process. 
And the inflation epoch after the Big Bang seems to imply randomness. Um, indeterminism, so is, is either proven or it's difficult to refute um, from these. So those are what I'm calling stochastic, which are genuinely random processes. Um, and then we've also got what I'm calling pseudo random processes. So there are a lot of processes that are error prone and there's a lot of them. So imperfect copying of RNA or DNA, uh, the COVID virus makes errors millions of times in every person that, that it gets copied and it's only rare that that becomes a viable thing. Mammalian conception is obviously a, a pseudo random process. Uh, cosmic radiation causing cancer, uh, chaos theory in weather, and then chaos theory in human affairs. Um, tiny decisions can have huge consequences. Um, and the question is, you know, maybe Laplace's demon can predict some of these or, or maybe it can't. So can, yeah. sure. one thing, one thing I haven't heard you mentioned yet, I don't know if it's going to come up, but like, what about a machine learning model that yeah. could it, could a machine learn, like, like even like at a basic level, can, can you build an AI that predicts chaotic processes? Right. And, uh, because what would that mean about determinism if that's possible? absolutely you, you could you could develop an AI model that would predict um, things, but AI predictions are in the current level of technology. Um, some of the AI projects that are running around the wider group, um, are, if they're lucky, getting to ninety percent. I'm getting some things a bit higher than that, but um, right. But, but I'm saying if it's conceptually yeah. possible. Hmm. I mean, I don't know. Like, uh, I'm more if you, you wanted feedback, right? Like, I was like, yeah, yeah, like, absolutely. No, one no, thing it, to consider is like, if yeah. it is conceptually possible to mm. create a machine learning model that can, because like, I think let's, I want to make it concrete for the audience, especially is like, mm. um, I think there is, uh, there's a, a TV series on FX called Devs by the director of Ex yep. Machina. Uh, I don't know if you want, for people going no. into sci fi. Um, and it's very much about this idea of like, subjectively you feel free will free will less once you see just how effective an ai is predicting what you're going to do next yeah. right <laughs> uh and uh obviously this is very true at a macro level like you were discussing yep. earlier right but like i think it, it i think it starts to work at an individual level i mean the upside of it is from a healthcare perspective like i think mm. it's great that yeah, we're going to be able to build AIs that predict our biology effectively enough, like to really make a huge difference in terms of our ability to live healthy lives, you know. But but if that's true, you can see how subjectively I think some people will feel like a, a huge loss of agency. Yep. Yeah, I absolutely hear what you're saying. Um, sometimes it's spooky how accurate uh, the AI is. On the other hand, sometimes it's funny. Um, when it keeps trying to sell you things that you bought last week. Uh, so, so um, but yes, conceptually, conceptually, it's it's going to be possible that AIs predict ourselves better than we can predict ourselves. That's certainly true. Um, yeah. And and what what that does for our sense of agency. Yes. Um, because I but think that's that point, very related yeah. to determinism, right? Yeah, because like for a sense of it, it is, but it, it's it's related to determinism, but it, it could also be related to compatibilism, which says that um, interesting free will hearing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, so you think there's that, a compatibilist reading position. of that? Yes. Okay. I think I think, but but yeah, but even so, you can still uh, take a decision to say, well, yes, AI thinks so I want to buy another pair of speakers, just like the pair I bought last week, but. Um, but uh, you can still decide to ignore that and put them on eBay and go and live on an island. Uh, I, th I think we it's only AI is relying that the future will look like the past. And that's correct. Right. A right. lot of the yeah. time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 But, and, and I was having this discussion in a, in a book club, um, in a meetup um, a few weeks ago. And um a guy who's actually a theosophist um, uh, said, um, used this free will and said, you know, we, we do get to throw off these constraints if we work at it. So I thought, anyway, we'll, we'll come to that. One of the, yeah. uh, I'll just add thing that real, this real quick. Uh, 
I think one of the ironies uh, is that Samir is, I, I use his meditation app. I love his meditation yeah. app. I think it's great. And I think meditation is one of the best ways to give people a sense of agency back. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, it's like the yeah. opposite. I, I don't think, you, like, it, yeah. yeah. So it's interesting that like, he's very good. I, I think about freeing you from the delusions, right? Like, and like helping you from like a mental health perspective, but then like philosophically, like yeah. you said, he's a hard, he's a hardcore determinist. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's that's right, and and that's where where compatibilism comes in. Anyway, I'm going to continue to argue a decision, a position that's between compatibilism and and libertarianism in a free will sense. Okay, um, so I want to talk about the concept of emergence. So, with this background that the universe, as we understand it, is fundamentally indeterminate with a lot of random and pseudo random processes, this is the background to emergence. And the definition of emergence, here's a good one that I found. An entity or system is observed to have properties unrelated to its constituent parts and unable to be predicted from them. Okay. So, for example, snowflakes and ants' nests and society and markets and economics and political parties, um, it's very hard to predict those things. They, they emerge kind of independently. Um, uh, it's, and here's, here's a good definition that I found. I took part of some work of Peter Corning and a few others. So something that's emerged has radical novelty, features that were inconceivable at the previous level. It's they're coherent, they're, they're an integrated whole. They're processes that we can perceive, observe, and work with. And reductionist analysis either doesn't work or or is or is quite limited. And so, for example, we have emergence in science where physics emerges from physics, we get chemistry, from chemistry, we get biology, from biology, we get evolution, and then from humanity, we get sociology, economics, politics, war. And in all these things, these processes at the higher level seem to override what's going on at the atomic level. There's, there's some influences up and down. The argument from the determinists, particularly Thad Roberts, for instance, is that things going on at the Planck level where he quantizes space time uh, are deterministic all the way up to someone deciding to throw a nuclear bomb at someone and someone else deciding to blow it up with a laser and no people die, but lots of birds do, and a, except for the three, A380 that was in the way or something. So uh, he, he assumes that all those things are utterly predictable and uh, from a quantized level of space time. All right, and to me, I, I submit that emergence is a feature of this simulation, this creation. That life, we know that life's formed in a manner. We haven't fully understood it. Um, we believe there's a sort of semi-naturalistic or at least naturalistic process will eventually be found. Um, in 1969, a meteorite crashed near the town of Murchison in Victoria and contained amino acids that uh, that differ from terrestrial amino acids. So that's a and there's there's debate over the age of that meteorite. Um, I've seen estimates between two and seven billion years, uh, but it, it's, it's highly suggestive that Earth is not the only place that um, complex life could evolve because at least we've, we've got, I probably want to see more, but there's a good start to, to reasonable evidence that um, amino acids exist on other than Earth. Uh, That's, by the way, that also yeah. happens to be the plot line of another movie by the guy who directed yep. Ex Machina and Devs, which yep. you referenced earlier. Yep. Uh, Annihilation with Natalie Portman is okay. about a cancer researcher that uh, goes into this uh, island uh, that is being biochemically transformed by a meteorite, you know, hitting it and bringing alien life. And you get to yep. see humanity interacting with an alternative life form <laughs> yeah and it's it's very it's very interesting because like we tend to think of aliens we tend to humanize them we have an kind of a throw you know an anthropic yeah, bias yeah, we, we've in that got sense. No, no idea in fact in fact you, we could even reference um the uh the three body problem on that where the the life uh trisol trisolaris was entirely um unrelated to that on earth couldn't even conceive uh anyway yeah so to me um this emergence overrides just any sense of determinism and fatalism. Okay, now there's some criticism that the word emergence just means magic or it's God of the gaps or it's an incomplete understanding of causation. 
Uh, and I, I heard, I've heard this criticism from a number of places. Um, I heard it on Jonathan Pajot's podcast. He's, a, he's an orthodox um, icon carver. Uh, I love listening to, to really smart people from really different places. Uh, and I, I've heard it from, from the atheist perspective as well. Uh, but uh, the fact that, that that's a, a possible critique um, doesn't invalidate its existence. And it doesn't, we need to study it. We need to understand these processes. How does one thing emerge from another? How does something that's so utterly different like consciousness emerge from what appears to be unconscious? Uh, we don't have a good answer for that. And anyone who thinks we do is kidding themselves. And in fact, I'd, I'd refer you back to the consciousness chat I did some months ago um, on the, the current positions and possibilities. All right, so David Chalmers says that strong emergence has happened at least once um, with consciousness. But if, it, if it's happened once, it, it could, free will fits the, uh, the thing of, um, it fits an emergent um, kind of phenomenon. Firstly, there's radical novelty, which leads to denialism. Like everything that's radically novel gets gets denied. Uh, you know, take for example um, the theory of plate tectonics. The the guy who who came up with that initially uh, was laughed out of the institutions. Uh, it's something that we can perceive. Uh, it's imperfect. I'll talk more about that. It's um it's something that's persistent. It's a feeling that we've got for a long time. And reductive analysis fails in this in this case of strong emergence. So, what are, where are we with um, scripture ethics and free will? Well, it's not just scripture, but why command anything? Why have traffic rules if people are if we aren't free free to choose or obey or not? Our entire planet is predicated on this concept that it feels like you can choose stuff. Uh, Scripture knows that our wills are weak and it urges you to flee temptation. It doesn't say resist temptation, it says flee temptation. Uh, you know, plan what you're going to do so that you don't get tempted. Uh, as God says, lead us not into temptation. Uh, we're also urged to proactively develop our own spirituality. Um, draw close to God. Do not neglect to meet with each other. Um, Self-control, you know, it's, it's related to discipline, it's related to free will, it's related to making choices. And it's specifically listed as a fruit of the Holy Spirit in, in um, Galatians 5.22. Who, who, who had that drilled into them as a young person? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, humility, self-control. Uh, I, I thank God for the Baptists. Uh, I, I, and I, I thank God that I never really believed them about the young earth thing. But apart from that, I, I got a lot of good stuff out of them when I was there. <laughs> Uh, there's this whole concept of repentance and change um, to reduce our sins to, to aim better. You know, sin means hamartia, to miss the mark. It's, it's an archery term, or, or maybe it even means more broadly to aim at the wrong thing. Um, and so our whole uh, our scriptures, our, our legal ethics, our, our parenting, our whole society is, is in some senses against determinism. It says you can choose. You can choose what you're going to do. Psychology is against determinism, uh, and the whole psychological therapy is is um, based on relies on people to make and execute plans, right? And I recently actually verified this. I went to see a, a therapist about a couple of things, and and I took five minutes out of the discussion, and and he was one hundred percent on board with this. That um, yeah, it's about uh, making people choose a better future. Uh, delaying gratification. So there's a famous marshmallow test. Has anyone heard of that? So uh, you, you get a bunch of three or four year olds and you put them in a room one at a time with a little desk and a marshmallow and you say, um, hey, I'm going to go away and get another marshmallow and I'm going to come back in like five minutes and if you don't eat it, then I'll give you the second one and you can eat both of them. Or you can eat this one now and not get the second one. That's up to you. Uh, that's uh, been correlated with future success in life, the ability to delay gratification. Um, and even Sam Harris, and this is where he kind of, he semi undercuts his own argument. So all those, the, the strings, the, the puppet strings on the, on the cover of his book, he says, you know, you can reach up and grab them. So, so he's committing this kind of logic, he's kind of logically contradicting himself where he's saying, you know, you can reach up and grab them. He's actually advocating um, what scripture is saying about being proactive to manage um, your mindset to manage your your, your health and, and your activities. 
And so I'd say, again, psychology and therapy are, are generally against determinism. Um, all right, here's a, here's a great book. Um, and I also mentioned um, Kelly McGonigal, G-O-N-I-G-A-L. You can, you can find her. Um, th these are two excellent books. Um, the interesting thing about um, McGonigal's book is she outlines, she articulates uh, something that sounds like a neurological basis for St. Paul's quote, the spirit wars against the flesh and the flesh wars against the spirit. Um, it's, it's fascinating. And, and all the research that's going on in the, the neural correlates of consciousness, uh, it, it could open enormous field for, for human enhancement. Um, at the moment, we're, we're enhancing ourselves by, by drawing close to God, by, by contemplation, by meditation, all those things. We, we might be able to do that better with, with some of these things as we understand. We might be able to trick our brain a bit. Um, so it talks about a whole bunch of things here. Um, all right, so here we are. Here's Stephen Covey, and I found the same quote from Vic, Viktor Frankl. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is the power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. And Covey's quote there, which uh, was influential to me, um, reading that, and I must have been, I don't know, about in my late 20s, I'm guessing. Um, the space between stimulus and response this is our freedom to choose. Okay. All right, so we, we can't um, cover this. I have this. a question for that, Jonathan. Yeah, sure. Um, yep. Yep. I, I'm very pro agency. I think Viktor Frankl's work yep. is actually amazing. The ability to hmm. retain, uh, to overcome hopelessness in a concentration camp. Yeah. Just for yeah. anybody who hasn't read the book, like it is life changing. It's what, and I'm not mm. somebody who says that frequently about books. I think, I think yeah, it's, I, it's so authentic, it, so yes. real. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, uh, but then I think about somebody addicted to fentanyl. Yep. Like, do we really need to give them logo therapy? Like, you know, like at some point, like I think there is a, and I think this is part of the challenge, right? Is that, like we even see this in medicine, mental health, psychiatry, right? Mm. It's like, how do you balance like uh, uh, embracing human agency while also recognizing neurobiology, like the reality of neurobiology? Yeah. Yep, yep, you're right. Um, people do get horribly addicted to things and, and, and need huge amounts of therapy and, and pharmacological interventions to overcome that as well. Um, I 100% agree with that. But, but even the act of saying, I'm addicted to this crap and I need to get off it, um, you know, is, is, the, is, is an expression of will in a way, isn't it? It's a choice. It's a choice to seek help or it's a choice to not seek help. It's a choice to remain you know, wallowing in your problems and saying, well, you know, alternatives are worse. Sometimes a choice to not act is, is itself a choice. It might be a highly constrained choice. It might be something that you're constrained um, pharmacologically in your head. Uh, it might be a choice. That's... What about, though, yeah. something like uh, what, what about something like schizophrenia? Yeah, absolutely. Pe people get mentally ill. Mentally ill they, they get a, a like, tumor. Are, in are they in charge? Because like, that's also a question like at a criminal law level. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, what is an actually insane person, right? That needs to be in an asylum yeah. versus somebody needs to go to prison. Uh, and that line is very blurry. That, that's that right. Is that is, and, and Sam Harris even, even suggests that if someone commits a crime because they've got a tumor in, the, in, their, um, in their forehead, in their, in their frontal cortex, um, he suggests that that's no different to um, somebody who commits a crime who's healthy but uh, grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. Um, and and there's certainly there's certainly some very deep criminal justice questions there that that the aim of the criminal justice system should be um, rehabilitation, um, not punishment. Uh, there, there's certainly there's a level of social safety that we want that we want um, murderers to to not get around. But uh, but yeah, we do we do have to acknowledge the the reasons people commit crimes and and work to avoid those. Um, Hundred percent agree with that. Um, but having hey, said that. Yep. Yep. Quick comment on that. I there there's pretty clearly some stimuli for which there is there is not a space before the response. You know, our bodies Absolutely. do many yeah. things that yeah. we don't intend. And that's a good thing, right? Because if I had to intend to keep my heart beating all day long, yeah. I'd be dead. 
That's um, right. on, on the other hand, it does seem like there's often kind of intuitive or instinctual things that we do that we sometimes can kind of catch ourselves mm. and stop ourselves from doing. Yep. And so s- some people have characterized this as free won't rather than free yes. will. And I think that's an mm. interesting idea to explore that a lot of things really, you know, our intentionality really isn't there. But for some things, it appears that there is that little space, sometimes little, sometimes big, and we can kind of insert some kind of volition mm. there. That, that's right. There's certainly a lot of automatic processes. Um, you know, if if I accidentally bump into someone, I automate, I don't stop and, and think about, I'll just automatically say, sorry, I didn't mean to do that, you know? Uh, so, yeah, and... And this is what I'm saying is, is humans are, what, one way of thinking about humans is we're a big bundle of habits uh, and we can work on those. Uh, all right. Um, let's, so I, I'm disappointed Neil's not here. Hi, Neil. How are you? Um, so there's two um, schools of Protestant thought here where Arminius emphasizes human responsibility and free will. and um, Calvin emphasizes God's sovereignty and there's heaps of Bible verses on on both sides that I'm not going to go through at the moment um, because we could be here for months um, but I, one useful way to think about this is to take things to a not quite ridiculous extreme and and see how that works um, so I was in a, a home group meeting in the 80s and uh, Someone said, look, you know, we Christians are the one who decide the size of the lake of fire, depending on how effective we are with our evangelism. And I thought, oh, boy, that's a that's a tough burden to bear. Um, the other extreme is um, God decides who's saved, so I don't need to evangelize. And when you took that to the extreme, um, we got the it reached its nadir in the in the Dutch Reformed Church of South Africa supporting apartheid. Uh, now I don't want to. I don't wish to blame Calvin for that. Uh, that was obviously distorted beyond what he intended. Uh, similarly, I, I don't wish to blame Darwin for scientific racism, which was an obvious distortion from from where he came from. So, uh, but once again, both those things diverged beyond what their what their original authors intended, because people did not listen to the disciplines around them. They got so focused on their own single discipline and. and uh, they were the they were the blind man with the with the ladder against the wall of the elephant. Um, uh, all right, um, Article Seventeen. So Omar and I come from a church that has in its foundational documents the doctrine of predestination. Uh, but it, but it's it's not something that you don't know about, right? It's it's described as you can feel God working in your life. You can choose to to be in that place. Um, and Neil and I were having um, were having lunch in a Mexican joint in Nashville one day, and I I said, look, um, and I mentioned this parable, the parable of the wheat and the weeds, or the wheat and the tears, if you're in the King James version, where um, the farmer went out and sowed a whole lot of good seed and the good seed came up, but also the tears came up as well. Um, that to me is is suggestive of emergence and somewhere there's something to do, there's, there's some sort of interaction going on here between emergence and predestination. And I think it, it needs to be a plank of any theodicy, theodicy meaning a, a justification of God in the face of suffering. Um, it needs to be a, a, a plank that somehow um, God permits but doesn't cause evil for some kind of higher purpose. Um, and so in the in the wheat and the tears, um, yeah, time will tell where this where this ends up, uh, but the the bad weeds are definitely um, coming up where any good weeds were planted. By the way, um, God is indeed calling us, and we're instructed in in scripture to use our free will, our initiative to make our calling and election sure. And so having faith is to trust Christ, not only for salvation, but for the transformation. So you know, tr- trust the program. The program is uh, draw near to God, make Jesus the defining centrality in your life. Uh, all right, let's keep going. 
Uh, so how to use your free will? Okay, so humans are decision-making beings. Hmm, are we free or not? I call this the Copenhagen interpretation of free will. Uh, we're decision-making beings, right? We're not sure exactly how that decision is made, but uh, yeah. As you said, Lincoln, very true. Much of our body operates without our will. Our will is constrained by society. Um, and so this is where uh, you can use your will to build habits. You can plan, what am I going to do tomorrow or the next day? Um, if you want to get fitter, you're going to plan, right, I'm going to do a run this day, that day, that day. And then you don't have to make decisions because your willpower is a kind of limited resource. So you want to use it for planning um, and you don't want to put too much stress on your, on your free will. Um, make this small sustainable change. Um, contemplating Christ. Uh, Lorenzo mentioned uh, meditation, which is, yeah, it's about contemplation. It's about being filled with the Holy Spirit. These are the things that bring change. And, and that's the free will that Sam and I both agree is grabbing that puppet string, if you like, ta taking, a, uh, taking a proactive approach to, to changing your constraints, to changing your habits. Um, and it's also said frequently that it, it takes faith um, in free will, it takes faith to make the change. Uh, and equally, it takes faith to, to get out of bed and think it's worthwhile to doing so. But Christians aren't the only people of faith. Atheists have faith also. They have a faith which denies um, that there's any intelligence outside the universe. Uh, they deny that there's randomness in nature, particularly Thad Roberts. Um, they deny the concept of emergence. They, they deny the whole... Um, the findings of the field of psychology about willpower and personal growth. They deny the hard problem of consciousness. They say that it's, it's not just an illusion, it's an illusion of being able to have an illusion. Uh, and so that's why I'm calling this denialist pseudo faith, um, which, which I agree with Sam, it, it gets seen in parts of the Christian church also, but I think it's just as, uh, it's just, um, it's the same as anybody who, who'd rather have um, answers that can't be questioned. And I think everybody in this room is in the we want, we want to have questions that can't be answered. Uh, so, and to overcome this kind of denialist pseudo faith, look outside your own narrow field. Integrate your insights with the integrate with the, the insights from a, a different field. Um, as I said, every act has some level of faith. Um, faith is the assurance of what we do not see. Um, we we can see emergence, but we can't see how it happens. We can feel consciousness, but we can't see where it came from. And we can we feel free will, but we can't see where it came from. So, having having faith is to have faith that uh, that we can use those things uh, that they are real. Uh, now, Christ Christ should be our goal, and and there's a sense in which whether you believe in in God or not, I, I think you should be. Uh, Jesus is either God incarnate, or he's the highest moral archetype that has emerged in the simulation. And in either of those instances, we should be following him. As Christians, we have superpowers, we have repentance, we have transformation. We can say, yes, that was the wrong thing. And we can admit that freely before God and we can move on with a clean slate, uh, having made restitution, and obviously done the right things. But we can... We can draw closer to God. This is something else that's an act of faith. It's saying, yes, if I decide to um, make my life central around Jesus, centered on Jesus, then, and I do all this stuff, it's going to um, it's going to have a real positive impact in my life. That we're not irretrievably bound. You know, we we face a lot of difficult forces, um, but we'll finish again with Hebrews um, in the definition of faith. Um, Let's join those who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful yeah, on social media. I might have changed that last bit. You get my drift, uh, that, that we got our ideas out there, that, that we weren't um, shrinking violence, but we were, that we weren't ashamed of the gospel, that we were positive and said, look, this is an entirely plausible and believable um, scenario as to why the world exists, um, how, how Jesus is our, our, our founding archetype, the logos, um, the, the mathematics on, on which the, uh, 
the, the whole place is built in, in a sense, something like Spinoza's God, except incarnate in the flesh with, uh, with agency and, uh, and with consciousness that, and, uh, and characteristics that we can only dimly perceive. Jonathan, question. Yes. Yep. So, but then you also see in the Gospels and even in Acts, especially. Yeah. Uh, a conversation about like demon possession and yeah. yep. like exorcism, which also looks like helping people with cerebral palsy, right? Uh, yeah. Like the, how does that fit into like this kind of calculation? Like, cause that's part of what the, the story is telling us, right? And that's not a very uh, free will. <laughs> thing. No, no, it's not. You're right, you're right. Um, well, I agree with you. I don't know if you're right. I agree, you guys. You. I agree with what you're saying. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Talk to y'all uh, soon. Yeah. Thanks a lot. It's great. Um, yeah, I agree that there's um, there are people who who get in an absolute bind, um, and it's very difficult to get out of, of where they're at. Um, and, and we need to you know approach those those situations with with compassion and care and uh, and what does success look like in those cases? Um, and what, is, what does success look like um, when you're born without arms or legs? Uh, yep, those, those, are, those are tough questions. Um, what, what does success look like when you're, when you're born with, with an IQ in the 50s? Uh, those, yeah, exactly, those, exactly, those are really tough exactly. questions. And, and I, um, uh, yeah, even those those people can still have a very elementary sense of right and wrong and repentance and forgiveness. Um, so I, I don't believe that salvation is beyond them. Um, and I, I don't, you know, and there's often a, a sense, you know, you're asking the question that, that Jesus asked, why is this man, um, why is this man disabled? Who, who committed the sin? Was it him or his father? Or his uh, and Jesus doesn't answer the question. He just heals the guy. Right? Wait, where is that? I, I can't think of... Uh... I'll, I'll, go and find, I'll go and find the scripture yeah, 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 for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, no, yeah, yeah. That's, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, no, for sure. I mean, like, there is a sense in which, like, there are a bunch of sick people that yep. are helpless and feel helpless and are told mm. that, right, they have a... Because, like, Mary Magdalene, right, like, she had seven mm. demons exercised from her. I mean, yep. what, what is that saying? I mean, that's supposed to be, it seems like it's very liberating, right? Uh, and yet, like, was Mary Magdalene, like, in charge of her mental faculties when she was possessed with seven demons in the story? Like, it's unclear, right? Uh, the... Yeah, it's, it's, it's unclear. Um, could she, but you know, even even that, that reaching out for help and she was, um, I guess, in a special place and time. Um, but yeah, um, the restoration of agency uh, to people in that situation is something that we need to work really strongly on. And, and I think to, it's interesting yeah. to bring the, because historically, right, bringing the gospel to, mm. you know, uh, the, to, to, you know, to the mentally insane, like the, because like it means some, they get something out of it, right? It may not be what like we would get yeah. out of it, right? But they get like, and and it's interesting, like, the I, I wish I had it on me, but like I read a paper recently mm -hmm. analyzing the how uh, different religious beliefs influence uh, schizophrenic uh, illusion uh, hallucinations. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and it was interesting how like yeah yeah like so the Christian ones right it's very much about demons it's about potentially being the Messiah mm -hmm. again like uh, right whereas if it's Buddhism like it's interesting like it was changing like if, if the person grew up yeah, in Islam they're... right like it's it's interesting that they're very influenced by it for sure. But that, that, that's right. But like, we're all incredibly influenced by the, the culture and, and the place in which we grow up and the, the genes that we've inherited. Um, you know, we're, we're all standing on, on, on the shoulders of, of giants who've gone before us. Um, some of those giants were, were really destructive and uh, some of us are reaping the consequences of um, things that our, our parents and our grandparents got wrong. Um, and or, or we're reaping the, the the consequences of the fact that um, we were born with the wrong skin color, and and therefore our grandparents couldn't own property. Um, or so yeah, 
I absolutely agree that that you know the gospel is about preaching preaching good news to the poor, and that includes restoration of agency. It it, it includes a, you know, a a way of empowering those people to to become uh, what they could be. Yeah, and and when people really feel that they have no free will and no ability to control their circumstances, part of the good news is released to the captives. Uh, that that can be a very a very hard thing for for people to perceive, and you can be in a very difficult place. Uh, but the the first and and best way forward is to try to recover that 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 sense of agency and that sense of well, at least I can decide to do this. All right. Yeah, cool. Thanks, everyone. Let's believe in in free will, and that's why I'm against determinism. Oh, there's some there's some leftover slides that I didn't use. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Jonathan. This was great. Right. Hey, Jonathan, one last comment for you. Yeah. Yep. Have you looked at uh, how Girdle's um, incompleteness theorems might relate to your? You know, defense? I've started I've started great puzzling question. over that. Great question. I've started puzzling over that. It seems like Gödel's theorems say that there are true things that we can't prove, is his first one. And his second one says that from within a mathematical system, you can't prove that it is consistent with itself. Have I got that right? Yeah, I, I like this. Yeah. Think of it in terms of um, completeness and consistency yeah. of yeah. systems, logical systems or mathematical yep. systems. So. It's impossible. Basically, it boils down to it's, it's impossible to have a system that is both consistent and complete. Yep. Which, in my mind, completely destroys determinism from any kind of logical yeah. perspective. Yeah. So claiming be, that it? we live in a yeah. in a um, deterministic system would be to deny. Uh, Gödel's theorems and and to say that they must somehow be false, which nobody has been able to demonstrate. Yeah, somebody may demonstrate it in future, but but equally maybe maybe that says that we're never going to reconcile um, quantum physics and general re relativity. I mean that would be that would be yeah, tragic I, if if we've reached the limit of our. Well, it doesn't say yeah. that there's limits. It just says that we can never reach the end. It just yeah. says that there's all basically what it I think on pragmatic grounds, what it's saying is that we should be happy because there will always be more to discover and create. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I'd like to. Why, why don't you put some thoughts down? I reckon you could do a talk on on Girdle for us because um, it's oh, a I don't very know. difficult subject. I've tried reading a bit on it. And, yeah, I, I think I just gave my talk. <laughs> I just like it. I, I, it's a hopeful yeah. for me, for me, the fact that we can't easily answer all questions is a very hopeful thing because hmm. the whole act of, of exploration and discovery and creation ultimately hmm. is what is one of the things that brings satisfaction to existence, to life. Um, and, and another important one, of course, is compassion and the relationships we have. But I think that combination of compassion and creation are ultimately what, what make us happy. And if we lived in a deterministic world, I don't think, well, if we live in a deterministic world, creation is just nonsensical. Yeah, it, it's it's a it's a it's a watch. It just goes tick 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 till it gets to the end. That's all. It, um, yeah, and compassion is meaningless. Yep. So I I really value Gödel's incompleteness theorems because they tell me hmm. that creation and compassion aren't incoherent or meaningless. That they, you know, that they'll always be useful hmm. and desirable, and that that motivates me a lot. Yeah, that's great. All right. How are you, Tim? You still there? You're on mute. 
Wait, you're talking to me? Yeah, I'm just asking, how are you? I haven't seen you for a while. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm doing pretty good. How are you? I'm, I'm, I'm very well. Any, any comments on the talk? Any critiques? Thank you for coming. Yeah. Oh, uh, thanks. Uh, I was actually... <laughs> so one of the things I thought um, earlier... And I didn't want to like jump in because it would have been kind of like a sidetracking of the point. But I think there was uh, something Lincoln said about um, uh, on point two, bullet point two, um, that yeah. it, it was about um, you've got either a brute fact or the the yep. sort of the turtles all the way down. Yep. issue i think i think there is another option um at, at least when it comes to god because if in classical theism as i understand it you you have god who is the sort of ground of being in existence right and, or logically necessary and it's logical necessity or like that which grounds necessity and possibility I would say that's a little bit different than a uh, mere brute fact. Um, but it, like Lincoln and I have yeah. like differences in philosophy anyway, but yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think, I think, and I didn't want to really distract from the discussion because it was really good. So <laughs> thanks. But have I, am I, let me make sure I've understood what you're saying. What, you, what I think you're saying is that, the logically necessary self-existent thing potentially could be the universe. Is that what you're saying? No, 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 no. No. It, it was um, that uh, that which grounds existence, like the, yep. the idea of philosophical grounding, right? Yeah. Or grounds uh, both possibility and necessity. Uh, hmm. Like I don't. That that's that's different from like a mere brute fact because a brute fact is something. That's the sort of simply the case. It, yeah, even, it just exists, yeah. Yeah. But whereas something ne necessary or grounding um, all other necessary things, I think that that is a bit different in conception. And that's how I understand classical theism. Uh, sorry for yeah. the noise in the background, guys. Yeah. No, look, um, thanks for your contribution, Tim. That, that's really... That's really handy. All right. Um, we might call it a night, eh? Thank you, Jonathan. Thank, thanks, everyone. Um, you, have you got the recording of this, uh, Lorenzo? Yep. Good to go. Okay. Good night, everyone. All right. Thanks, everyone. See ya.